Hello. Good morning. Hola. Bonjour. Guten Tag. Ciao. Ni hao. Namaste. Aloha. And for those of all of you listening from Japan, konnichiwa. Uh, it's a pleasure to introduce today's Global Immuno Talk speaker, Dr. Kenya Honda. Uh, Dr. Honda uh, is a doctor. He got his MD at Kobe University, and then he went on to get his PhD at Kyoto University in Japan. He then rose through the ranks at the University of Tokyo as an assistant professor uh, at, and is now currently a team leader um, at, of the Laboratory of Gut Homeostasis at the Riken and also a professor in the Department of Microbiology and Immunology at Kyo University. Uh, Dr. Honda has been a recipient of many awards for his trailblazing work that I'll describe in just a few, few seconds. Um, he's received the Gottfried Wagner Prize, the Tatsuchi Nomura Prize, the 32nd Inyao Prize for Science, the Bayels Prize, the Kitsatsu Prize, and Carlos Finlay UNESCO Prize for Microbiology. Uh, and it's just uh, been, it's his, his he's been a a, a real tour de force in the field of uh, understanding our microbiome and how our immune system and our and how our physiology interacts with our commensals and and pathobiomes. He has been a leading discoverer, is the first to have to be a part of one of the most seminal papers in um, our in microbiome history in the field of immunology with the discovery of um, segmented filamentous bacteria. Uh, driving Th17 responses in the intestine. And he his work um, translates both from, from mirroring animal models to, to humans with really a focus on trying to identify the microbes that specifically train our immune system in various ways. He was one of the first to identify clostr clostridia bacteria that induce regulatory T cells. Um, and more recently has then gone on to identify specific strains that induce Th1 cells and CD8 T cells. And, and more recently, some very fascinating work on how bile acids, which are produced, secondary bile acids that are produced from the microbiome can regulate aging and, and, and longevity as, uh, as they focused in the study on centarians. Uh, so just really some phenomenal work in decoding and dissecting how our microbiome can control our immune system and our immune responses and our and and the and infl inflammatory diseases. Um, he's working towards uh, developing defined microbial therapeutics, and that's the the title of his talk. Um, and we wanted to ask Kenya a question, like we we always do. And so Ke Kenya, again, it's a, it's just a pleasure to have you. Uh, speak for this uh, series. And I want we wanted to find out from you, what is the trait in your personality that helped you the most in your scientific career? There you are. Okay, so, uh, thank you very much too for the generous introduction. It's a great pleasure and honor uh, to be a speaker of the Global Immune Talks. Thank you very much for inviting me. So regarding your question about the trait that helps, helps helped me the most in my scientific career, actually, I don't have any particular talent. But I think I have a strong motivation to develop new therapeutics to treat patients suffering from intractable, currently intractable diseases. So after graduation, uh, after graduating from medical school, I started practicing oncology, where I where I start uh, I treated several patients with terminal cancer using chemotherapy and radiation. Though the treatments were generally ineffective, so as a result, I witnessed the passing of many patients and was struck by a deep frustration in my in my abilities and more generally in the medicine. So then I changed my major to gastroenterology and worked with inflammatory diseases, inflammatory bowel diseases, including Crohn's disease. So at that time, the biologics such as the anti-TNF antibody were not commonly available and steroid and elementary, elementary diet treatments were often ineffective. 
So this was yet another disappointing experience. So this uh, series of disappointments forced me to seriously reconsider our collective understandings of pathophysiology related to diseases that cause such immense suffering. So therefore I decided to pursue a career in basic science and here I am and still struggling. So uh, the kind of uh, in summary, uh, such disheartening clinical experience experiences have continuously given me strong motivation that helped helped me immensely in my scientific career. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. So now I'd like to move on to my presentation. So here's my COI to disclose. And I've been working on the gut microbiome. And it, it is generally known that the less diverse and the less functional gut microbiome can cause various diseases, including immunorelated disease, metabolic disease, and, and cardiovascular disease, cancer, and infectious diseases. So therefore, the normalization of the gut microbiota may, may be an option for uh, these uh, several diseases. However, currently, the most, most effective way to manipulate and improve the function of the gut microbiota is fecal microbiota transplantation from healthy individuals. Although FMT is actually effective in treating certain diseases, however, FMT has the several limitations. Fecal microbiota um, may contain pathogens, therefore FMT is potentially unsafe, and fecal microbiota is uncontrollable, therefore predicting the effectiveness of FMTs are pretty difficult. So therefore, FMT should be supplanted with rationally designed microbial therapeutics consisting of well-characterized effector bacterial strains. So in order to identify effector bacterial species among uh, members of the gut microbiota, two complementary methods have been developed in our laboratory. So one is a top-down notobiotic approach, starting with colonization of germ-free mice with human fecal microbiome, followed by serial microbiota transplantation while maintaining the uh, focused phenotype to narrow down the bacterial community to uh, uh, identify uh, a minimal vector bacterial uh, consortium. So the other one is a bottom-up approach, starting with small molecules uh, associated with a given phenotype, for example, by metabolomic analysis, and searching our culture collection uh, for responsible microbes, followed by functional validation using mice. So in both approaches, Bacterial culturing is quite essential technique. So therefore we have made substantial effort to develop our technique to culture anaerobic bacteria. And we have acquired uh, kind of extensive expertise. And now we can isolate 60 to 70% or maybe more of the members of the human microbiota. And moreover, we have developed germ-free and notobiotic animal facilities to test the in vivo effects of the isolated bacterial strains. So by, co by combining anaerobic culturing and notobiotic technique together with NGS-based sequencing, we have been trying to dissect the complex microbiota and identify effector bacterial strains. So by using this method, we have identified multiple immunomodulatory bacterial consortia, such as regulatory T cell inducing bacterial strains, uh, TS70 inducing, TH1 cell inducing, interferon gamma positive C positive T cell inducing bacterial strains. In particular, 17 regulatory T cell inducing strains are going to be evaluated in a phase two clinical study by Vedanta Biosciences and, uh, and Pfizer as a new treatment for inflammatory bowel disease. And the 11 seeded positive T cell inducing strains are in the middle of phase one and two uh, study, 
aiming at treating patients with PD-1 antibody refractory cancer such as melanoma who had previously failed treatment with anti-PD-1 antibody by again Vedanta Bioscience and Bristol Myers Squibs. And recently, we have extended our research into the fields of pathogen infection, metabolism, and cancer. And today, among these uh, projects, I'd like to introduce two uh, recent studies related to pathogen infections. The first one is an example of the top-down notobiotic approach in which we identify the trypsin regulating paraplevotera species. So this study was conducted by a talented graduate student, Eichiro Watanabe, with a, a brilliant postdoc, former postdoc, Yokshan Lee. So we first performed a protomic assessment of feces from germ-free and SPF mice, and found that the levels of several host proteins were higher in feces of germ-free mice as compared to SPF mice. So among them, this trypsin attracted our attention. The proteomic data was validated by trypsin activity test and western protein and uh, of, of feces and immunostaining of colon sections with an anti-trypsin antibody and the increased level of trypsin in the feces and in the colon of germ-free mice was obvious as compared to SPF mice. So then we examined the trypsin activity in the lumen of the jejunum, ileum, cecum, and colon of SPF mice. And this analysis revealed that trypsin activity uh, was high in the small intestine, but the level suddenly dropped in the cecum of SPF mice. In contrast, in germ-free mice, the, uh, the trypsin level remained high even in the cecum and the colon. So therefore, these results suggest that uh, the trypsin produced by pancreas is usually broken down by commensal bacteria colonizing the cecum. So therefore, we wanted to identify bacteria that can break down trypsin. So to identify trypsin degrading bacteria, we obtained stool samples from six healthy volunteers, and the stool samples were each already administered to germ-free mice, housed in uh, individual sterile vinyl isolators. And fecal trypsin activity in the recipient mice were examined. And the tested human fecal samples showed uh, considerable variability in their capacity to reduce the fecal trypsin activity in the recipient mice, for example, the sample from donor B did not reduce trypsin activity at all, whereas fecal microbiota from donors CDEF all greatly reduced it. So among these effective microbiota colonized mice, we selected donor C microbiota colonized mice for the follow-up analysis. And actually, mouse C number five was selected and secret contents from uh, this mouse was what were collected and inoculated into another four groups of germ-free mice. And the mice were then treated with different antibiotics through the drinking water to part of the microbiota. And then we queried uh, fecal trypsin activity in each group of recipient mice over time. And in mice uh, colonized with uh, C number five microbiota without antibiotics treatment. So please look at this black line here. Fecal trypsin activity was nicely decreased by day five. Interestingly, as shown in the red line here, the fecal trypsin activity was further reduced by ampicillin treatment. So in contrast, treatments with the other antibiotics abrogated this uh, trypsin reduction effect. So therefore, responsible bacteria were enriched in these mice, but reduced in these mice. So we therefore selected one of the ampicillin treated mice, and actually we collected secret contents from uh, this 
C5 amp, amp number five mouse and and cultured them in vitro and successfully isolated 35 individual strains. And we then examined the effect of the uh, 35 isolates by generating notobiotic mice. And we found that fecal trypsin activity and concentration were markedly decreased in 35 mixture colonized mice. So then, uh, I don't go into detail, but using Notobiotic Pipeline, we successfully narrowed down from 35 to 14 and to 9, and eventually to three bacteroidetes test strains without compromising trypsin redu reducing activity in vivo. And then we performed an in vitro experiment using recombinant trypsin, and we incubated the recombinant trypsin with each individual strain for 24 hours in vitro. And as you can see here, among three bacteroidetes test strain, uh, strains, Parabacteroides, uh, sorry, Paraplebotella clara uh, uh, strain 1C4, only this strain was able to degrade recombinant trypsin. So therefore, uh, we concluded that the this uh, Paraplebotella clara was responsible for the observed trypsin degradation in this experiment. So to examine the mechanisms underlying P. clara mediated trypsin degradation, we tested the effects of several protease inhibitors. And among inhibitors, uh, as you can see here, trypsin-specific inhibitor TLCK uh, completely blocked the uh, paraplebotella clara mediated trypsin degradation. So therefore, trypsin degradation by Piclara is likely mediated by trypsin itself dependent autolysis. And interestingly, when Piclara was incubated with fluorescently labeled trypsin in the presence of trypsin inhibitor TLCK, we observed the trypsin accumulation on the surface of Piclara within minutes. So therefore, Piclara probably expresses uh, trypsin binding surface molecules, which facilitates trypsin accumulation on the surface and promote its autolysis. So to identify responsible molecules, we again used several inhibitors. And luckily, we found that both trypsin accumulation and trypsin degradation were severely blocked by tunicamycin treatment. So tunicamycin is known to inhibit the biosynthesis of LPS polysaccharide via interfering with bacterial wakeway activity. So therefore, uh, LPS polysaccharide binding surface molecules may be involved in trypsin accumulation and degradation. And notably, in the whole genome sequence of P. clara, we identified genes are predicted to be components of the type 9 secretion system. So our type 9 secretion system is known to be a transporting system that delivers bacterial proteins across the outer membrane of bacteria and conjugates the protein to a lipopolysaccharide, polysaccharide, uh, thereby anchoring the protein to the surface of bacteria. So we hypothesized that uh, this kind of surface molecules delivered by type 9 secretion system might be involved in the accumulation and degradation of trypsin. So to test this hypothesis, we generated polu uh, deficient P. clara strain. So polu is, a, is an essential component of type 9 secretion system. And as you can see here, the polu mutant P. clara showed a complete defect in trypsin degradation. So therefore, type 9 secretion system dependent surface molecules are likely involved in the trypsin degradation. So to search for such uh, T9SS dependent surface molecules, we, connect, we, co we conducted the protomic assessment of culture supernatants of P. clara uh, in the presence or absence of tunicamycin. And we searched for molecules that was shed from the surface and accumulated in the supernatant 
in the presence, only in the presence of Junika Manshin. So, uh, and please look at these, these red bars here. Several bacterial molecules were found to be increased in the, in the culture supernatants of Piccolara in the presence of Junika Manshin. So then we generated a series of mutant Piccolara strains, disrupting each of those genes from left to right and examined all of them. So although this was a painful and laborious experiment. And luckily, we found that the disruption of 00502 or 509 genes resulted in abrogation of trypsin degradation, much like PolU or WECUA uh, mutant uh, apicular strain. So although we don't know the structure yet, uh, the 502 and the 509 molecules are perhaps delivered by type 9 secretion system and bind to LPS and probably cooperatively recruit trypsin and promote its autolysis. So we are uh, further evaluating this model. So next, we examine the inference, inferences of trypsin degrading piculara colonization in vivo. So since piculara alone cannot colonize the mouse intestine, we colonized the germ-free mice with two trypsin non-degrading mix together with wild type or 502 mutant piculara. And in the presence of wild type piculara, intestinal luminal trypsin was, was severely decreased. In contrast, 502 mutant strain failed to reduce the uh, trypsin level. But interestingly, inverse trend was observed for IgA level. IgA was maintained in the presence of trypsin degrading piculara, whereas it was reduced in the presence of high level of trypsin. So therefore, it appears that IgA is one of the most trypsin sensitive molecules and without trypsin degrading bacteria, IgA can be degraded by trypsin. But in the presence of P. Clara, trypsin is degraded and consequently IgA is maintained. So therefore, it appears that P. Clara is one of the beneficial bacteria contributing to the maintenance of intestinal homeostasis via maintaining IgA. And interestingly, uh, in addition to trypsin, piculala appeared to promote degradation of another serine protease, TMPRSS2, in the intestine. So TMPRSS2 is known to be involved in the cleavage of spike protein of, and promote the entry of coronavirus. So therefore, by reducing the levels of both trypsin and the TMPRSS2 in the intestine, PQRA might contribute to inhibition of coronavirus infection from the intestine. So to test this hypothesis, we used murine hepatitis virus, which is a mouse version of coronavirus. So we again colonized germ-free mice with two trypsin non-degrading mix together with wild type or 502 mutant piculara. And then the mice were uh, administered with uh, murine hepatitis virus by intragastric garbage. And the difference was stunning. And wild type piculara colonization contributed to protection of the mice from lethal infection by this uh, murine hepatitis virus while 502 mutant piculara colonized mice succumbed to the infection. And the liver sections from 502 mutant piculara colonized mice showed a lot of necrotic lesions, whereas wild piculara colonized mice showed no or only a few, if any, lesions in the liver. So these results suggest that trypsin degrading piculara colonization provides a protective protective benefits to the host uh, during uh, coronavirus infection, and maybe also protective against SARS-CoV-2 infection. So to uh, investigate this possibility uh, of beneficial effect of piculala colonization, we recruited 141 patients 
who were hospitalized at our university with COVID-19. And we collected faces from patients following discharge from the hospital. And we examined the association the, of the carriage of 502 homolog genes in the gut microbiome with diarrhea frequency. And we found that individuals who did not carry 502 homolog genes had a higher frequency of experiencing severe diarrhea. So of course we need further investigation, but these results are consistent, are consistent with our hypothesis that trypsin degrading commensal colonization may provide protective benefit against SARS-CoV-2 infection. So we are, are further testing this uh, possibility. So now uh, the second part of my talk is about an example of bottom-up approach. So in which we identified unique bilashit metabolizing bacteria from centenarians microbiota. So this study has been conducted by Yuko Sato and Koji Atarashi with the help from Damian Brichter and Romnick Zabiel from the Broader Institute. So centenarians aged 100 years and older are less susceptible to age-related diseases such as cancer, uh, diabetes, obesity, hypertension, and cardiovascular disease. Moreover, they have survived, survived periods of hunger and several boats with infectious diseases such as flu, tuberculosis, sigillosis, and salmonellosis. So we reason that they might have beneficial microbes in the intestine. So in collaboration with Dr. Hirose at the, of the Center for Super Centenarian Medical Research at Keio University, we aim to identify symbiotic beneficial bacteria in the gut microbiota of centenarians that might contribute to resistance to pathogen infection and other environmental stresses. So we actually recruited 160 centenarians, all Japanese, and collected their fecal samples. And as controls, we also collected feces from elderly aged around 85 and young controls aged around 30. And we compared their fecal microbiome and the metabolites. So here's the metagenomic sequencing data, which was obtained in collaboration with Damian Brichter and Romnick Xavier. And the microbiome composition of the centenarians was found to be uh, uh, pretty different from those of the other groups. And centenarians showed increase in the in microbia such as Ackermansia and proteobacteria such as uh, Dysrufobiblio species. And there was a decrease in actinobacteria. But a more interesting observation was made by the analysis of fecal bile acid uh, fecal acid. And as you can see here, uh, the fecal bile acid compositions of centenarians were pretty different from those of the controls. In particular, please look at this uh, red, red bus here. This uh, isolitocolic acid was specifically enriched in centenarians two samples. So this is a CAG secondary bile acid biosynthesis pathway depicting transformation uh, from the primary bile acid, uh, acid, CDC8, to uh, the secondary bile acid, ritocolic acid. So this transformation involves multiple enzymes carried by the gut microbiota. But importantly, the generation pathway for the ISO-RLCA had not been reported. So we predicted that ISO-RLCA might be generated from this 3 oxo delta 4 lca via 3 oxo rlca by 5-alpha reductase and 3 beta hydroxysteroid dehydrogenase. So this was because ISO-RLCA is structurally similar to 3 beta understand and 3 oxo rlca is similar to dihydrotestosterone, and 3 oxo delta 4 lca is structurally similar to testosterone. So we predicted that 3 oxo rlca might arise from 3 oxo delta 4 lca via pathway similar to the 5-alpha reduction of testosterone by adding 
the hydrogen, a hydrogen atom uh, to the carbon five position after the cleavage of the double bond between carbons four and five. And we also predicted the subsequent transformation from 3-oxyl alo-LCA to iso lca uh, might involve 3 beta HSTH, mirroring the 3 beta HSTH mediated conversion of dihydrotestosterone to 3 beta androstenadiol by replacing the uh, oxyl group to hydroxy group at the carbon 3 position. So anyway, to identify iso lca generating bacterial strains, we selected uh, this person, C91, because this individual showed a high level of iso lca in the feces and uh, maintained a relatively good health condition. So from the stool sample of C91 centenarian, we isolated 68 individual bacterial strains. So here's a list of the 68 isolated bacterial strains, which contain the pretty diverse species. So we then tested their viral acid metabolizing capabilities using an in vitro culture system. So we used CDCA or 3 oxyl delta for LCA or LCA as a substrate, and each individual bacterial uh, isolate or was cultured in vitro in either of these Bilashit compounds. And the culture supernatants were analyzed by LCMS. So, and as you can see here, the incubation with CDCA did not result in accumulation of isoar LCA in any of the cultures of 68 bacterial strains at all. And again, when cultured with LCA, none of them was able to generate iso-LCA. But excitingly, when we used 3 oxyl delta lca as a substrate, high levels of iso-LCA were detected in the cultures of several bacterial strains. So here's a, a, a little, bit, little, little bit zoom up of uh, this part. And uh, among the 68 bacterial strains tested, Strain 3, Parabacteroides melde, and strain 19, Odoribacter laneo strain, or uh, strain 21 to 24, Odoribacteria shy, undefined Odoribacteria shy strains, were found to be able to transform from 3 oxo delta 4 LCA to iso LCA very effectively. So uh, we then sequenced the genomes of uh, these strains and found that Parabacteroides melde and Odoribacter strains carry gene clusters containing 5-alpha reductase and 3-beta hydroxysteroid dehydrogenase genes. So we thus generated 5-AR or 3-beta HSTH gene deficient B melde strains by conjugation mediated plasmid transfection and homologous recombination. So when 3 oxo delta 4 LCA was used as a substrate, wild type P. melde was able to produce iso LCA uh, very effectively, whereas a 5 AR mutant, actually we obtained three uh, mutant strains, all failed to produce iso LCA. But in contrast, when 3 oxo LCA, so this one was used as a substrate, both wild type and 5L mutant strains were able to produce iso LCA effectively. But in the case of 3 beta HSTH mutant uh, deficient strain, 3 beta HSTH mutant strain failed to generate iso LCA at all, whether incub incubated uh, with 3 oxo delta 4 LCA or 3 oxo alo LCA. So these results are all supporting for our predicted transformation pathway from 3 oxo delta 4 lca to 3 oxo alo lca and 2 iso lca by 5-alpha reductase and 3-beta HSTH. Now, Eric Pamer at U Chicago and Cassie Terriot at the North Carolina State University and several other groups have shown that secondary viral acids 
such as LCA and DCA, can inhibit the growth of antimicrobial resistant clostridioides difficile. So therefore, we tested the effect of isar LCA on C. difficile. So we incubated the C. difficile with, uh, with different concentrations of isar LCA or other viral acid compounds and measured the growth of C. difficile over time. And surprisingly, isar LCA showed a very strong effect even at the lowest concentration tested in this experiment, C. difficile did not grow at all in the presence of isar LCA. And actually, the MIC-19 was quite low as compared to the other viral sheet tested. And the scanning electron microscopy revealed that isar LCA was very much bactericidal and disrupted the cell wall of uh, C. difficile. And interestingly, besides C. difficile, isar LCA was also inhibitory to vancomycin resistant enterococcus fashion, VRE. So isar LCA MIC90 was again against VRE was around 2.5 micromolar, which was much, much lower than that of the other virus tested. And scaring electron microscopy of VRE revealed that isar LCA produced morphologic alterations such as large and explosive bacterial cells. In contrast, E. coli was totally insensitive to isar LCA. And actually we have tested several gram-positive and negative pathogens and found that to all the gram-positive pathogens, including C. difficile, VRE, perforingens, and the staphylococcus aureus, isar LCA exerted very strong growth inhibitory effects and the MIC-90 was quite low. But in contrast, gram-negative pathogens such as Klebsiella, E. coli, Salmonella are all, all, all insensitive to all the virus tested, including isar LCA. So therefore, isar LCA are producing bacteria such as Odolibacter and Parabacteroides melde are likely uh, contributing to preventing prevention of gram-positive pathogen colonization. And interestingly, Jun Fu and Slom Debrin and Dan Littman have shown that isar LCA can induce the development of regulatory T cells in the intestine. So therefore, the combination of these effects might be contributing to the maintenance of intestinal homeostasis in centenarians and it might have something to do with the healthy longevity. So uh, these works has been conducted with kind of helps from many collaborators, including uh, Ramnik Zabiel, uh, Damian Prichter, uh, Dan Leitman, Michael Fischberg, uh, and many others. So I stop here and thank you for your attention. Great, thank you so much, Kenya. That was a, a beautiful talk and just the way that you're able to navigate not only the discovery of the pathogens or the, the microbiota, but also how they're um, really uh, mechanistically affecting um, the environment and our other uh, microbiota in our, in our intestines. Um, we would love for you to reach out to Dr. Honda directly uh, through Twitter. He has his own Twitter address. Um, at least people are still using Twitter for now, I guess. Um, it's at Honda1Kenya. Um, please go ahead and, um, as you see here, search for the account Global Immunotox, uh, and then you'll find a tweet that says, ask your questions for Dr. Kenya Honda here, um, and uh, he will reply to that, that tweet, and um, you, in the, in the next few days, um, please let us know if, if, if you're not um, seeing replies, we'll try to, to get uh, Dr. Honda to, to do that. But again, thank you so much for joining us. It was our pleasure to um, uh, help organize this for the community and uh, bring immunology uh, to the world. So thank you very much. Bye.